So welcome to game number two of Historical Board Gaming's Global War 1936. So hopefully in this game, won't make some of the same uh, mistakes and errors um, from game number one. Again, if you guys uh, notice anything, not just uh, mistakes or errors, but also maybe some uh, strategic blunders, things you guys might have done differently, then feel free in the comment section. This is going to be a, another turn-by-turn -turn, uh, uh, video release. So completed turn one here. Not a lot uh, really going on as is typical in turn number one. Um, we'll start over here in the Pacific. Um, not much at all going on. Um, Japan, again, stayed away from attacking China um, on turn one here. Basically, just with the Japanese thinking is, um, you know, the Communist Chinese, the CCP, and the National Chinese, the KMT, are going at it right now. So Japan's just kind of staying out of the fray, letting them uh, fight, each, fight it out a little bit, maybe weaken each of them, and then Japan kind of swoops in. Now, that's kind of the strategy they followed last game, and it didn't work out so well. The CCP got rolling, and uh, it was kind of like a, just a steamroller. They rolled right over uh, the KMT and then even um, the Japanese, at least on uh, mainland China. So, but Japan's at least going to sit it out probably for a couple turns. They also want to kind of build things up a little bit. They didn't even really move too much around. They moved some ground units that came down from northern Manchuria down into Korea. The thinking there is now they're in a position to be picked up with this fleet of Japanese transports so they can move those ground units around. Again, Japan probably isn't going to put too much, at least... Um, the thinking at the beginning of the game, putting too much into China, um, just the risk reward. Uh, there's not a lot of high IPP value in the Chinese territories. Um, Japan's going to mostly try to, again, go for the money islands. And when they are at war with the Western allies, they're going to go heavy after um, either the FEC or ANZAC, try to get one of them at least out of the conflict before the United States enters. So at least at this point, unless an opportunity presents itself in terms of um, the CCP and KMT just like completely uh, virtually annihilating each other, Japan's going to mostly stay out of China for this, uh, uh, for this game and concentrate on building up um, some ground units because they already start the game with five transports. So, And again, Japanese destroyers can also take one ground unit as well. So Japan already starts the game with quite a few naval units that can move um, um, some of their ground forces around in the Pacific. So they're just going to concentrate on building up the Navy um, at the same time, trying to avoid increasing the U.S. income. So they have to kind of stay away from the capital ships, but they can do destroyers, which will also serve the dual purpose of transporting their ground units. Um, they can do subs. So there's a few different options that they have to build things up. And again, they're going to go heavy South Pacific and eventually one of the two um, allied countries down here in the South Pacific, either ANZAC or the Far East Command. <clears throat> so uh, with that thinking, Japan, again, just kind of maneuvered some ships around, moved some ground units into Korea. Um, the KMT and the CCP are obviously at war here in China. The CCP did take Szechuan off of uh, the KMT, but then on their role for uh, influencing a warlord, they did not get it. So um, they only had a role of a one or a two, and I think they got like an eight. So the CCP is just right now confined to two territories. The KMT just put some infantry down, moving up here into Shangtung possibly to uh, counterattack Szechuan here on uh, turn number two. Uh, the warlords just kind of sitting it out for now, seeing which way the wind blows with the uh, Chinese Civil War going on. Uh, besides that, not much else in China. The Far East Command, again, just maneuvering some naval units around. They did upgrade a militia to an infantry in British Malaya. Um, Anzac upgraded one infantry from a militia, saved the rest of their money. 
Uh, the U.S. didn't do anything. Um, they really can't move these naval units around again. Um, what I learned from last game is the uh, U.S. fleets cannot um, switch from the Atlantic to the Pacific until um, the U.S. reaches a certain um, income level. So they're far away from that. So the U.S. is just kind of sitting things out, saving their money. Uh, the Russians doing things a little bit different. Um, again, based on some of the comments from the last game, they're going to be going after Mongolia here. So they're kind of maneuvering some units here in the Far East on the border with these two Mongolian territories. They have IPP value. So at some point, probably in the not too distant future, uh, the Russians will be coming into Mongolia there and uh, trying to take out those couple of IPP value territories. Switching over to the Middle East, again, the Russians doing the same kind of thing. They've got some units down here in the Transcaucasus, um, two infantry and a cavalry. They're gonna be moving into Iran at some point. Again, the thinking there is they want to get as many territories um, that have an IPP, IPP value as possible. That's part of their um, victory point total. So, and especially if the game kind of follows the lines of um, game one, then Russia's probably not going to get a lot of those IPP territories in Europe itself. So they need to look elsewhere. So the reasoning behind uh, massing on the border with Mongolia as well as uh, Iran. In Europe itself, uh, the Germans typically um, went into Austria, so they um, activated that for the Reich. Uh, besides that, they did buy a Fallschirmjäger they placed in Berlin, um, moved some of their air units around, and again, just kind of maneuvering things around um, with the border with both France and Poland. Um, Germany following at least initially probably the same kind of strategy they had in game number one. They're going to look to use their lightning war special move um, a little bit down the road here, but hopefully it will, for them, they'll be taking out France, Poland, um, Denmark, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, all of those they want to take out on the lightning war move. Um, on the turn, they use the lightning war. So they're following the script of game number one and just kind of massing units here in Bavaria. They've got a stack of about four infantry, three artillery. Um, they also, again, moved some stuff out of the border with Poland. So most of their money went to um, ground units, although they did buy the one Fallschirmjäger. So um, possibly dropping that somewhere a few turns down the road here once they are at war. They did also send... Um, one infantry unit to, uh, for the Spanish Civil War. So the Nationalists and the Republicans are fighting it out there. So uh, the Germans went ahead and are supporting Franco, of course. Uh, besides that, not a lot for Germany to do. Um, the Allies, or at least the future Allies, the British and the French, um, the French just kind of maneuvered their fleets around again. A, a big fleet's here uh, anchored off of southern France. And then a couple of battleships and a couple of destroyers are here at the mouth of the Mediterranean. Again, the thinking there is um, France probably isn't going to survive the initial German assault, although in game number one it was actually closer than I thought at first. So if the French can survive, their naval units will be in a position to possibly go after Italy if uh, the Italians throw their hat in the ring um, like they did in game number one. Uh, the British went ahead, again, maneuvering some fleets around. They got a nice fleet anchored off of um, Alexandria. They also got some more naval units coming here off of Gibraltar. They moved a medium bomber down to Gibraltar, and then they concentrated significant naval assets here um, off of uh, England itself. That was really about it for the British and the um, French. The U.S., again, didn't do a thing. They left everything in the same position other than just simply moving up this light tank that's trying to get to the coast so that when the U.S. does get in the war, which will be far down the road, um, that'll be on the, the east coast of the United States to be able to be uh, transported over. Other than that, the U.S., again, not much to do here in turn number one. The Italians, they did. That was the other, um, the second of three sources of conflict here early in the game and they went into Abyssinia and they took that they lost one infantry as a result 
So the Italians got that. They also maneuvered some units here into Cyrenaica. The Italians this turn, besides, again, uh, like Germany, committing an infantry unit to um, Franco's forces in the Spanish Civil War, they actually bought a naval transport. Um, they didn't start the game with any naval transports at all, so they bought one, uh, one transport, so now it can start maneuvering some of these uh, ground units in Italy itself. And again, the thingy behind that is, in the last game, uh, Italy's navy um, held on for a little bit once Italy entered the conflict, but not for very long. And the same kind of thinking, I don't think, um, I don't believe the Italian Navy is going to be able to stand up to, um, the Allies. So in game number one, Italy mostly went for, um, an air force, not only building up fighters and tacticals, but eventually building up air transport units to get units from Italy into, uh, North Africa, thinking that, you know, any transports they buy are going to be a waste because they're just going to get sunk by the Allies before they even really have a chance to um, perform their job, which is getting some units over here to North Africa. But clearly, um, Italy um, isn't at war with the uh, Western Allies at this point, so no danger of buying transports and having them sunk right away. So Italy probably for the first couple of turns are going to buy uh, several transports here so that they're in a position they can move some units over to North Africa before the war um, for Italy even begins. And then at that point, if the, if the transports are destroyed, at least they were able to, um, for several turns, um, get units into Africa for Italy. So um, that was how Italy spent their money. As far as the third source of uh, conflict here early on turn one, it is the Spanish Civil War. So that's in full effect. Now, Franco's forces did initially take this northern territory here. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, so I'm probably, I'm sure I'll butcher the name. But they did take that territory, so that left them with three of the six uh, territories possessed um, on continental Spain. Um, they didn't get their recruitment role, so they got no free units. Um, although, again, both Germany and Italy each supplied Actually, Germany supplied an artillery and Italy supplied an infantry unit. Um, and then the Soviet-backed forces, the Russians dropped an infantry, or excuse me, they also dropped an artillery down. Um, so then uh, the Russian-backed forces took this northern Spanish territory and they also took this vacant territory down here. Um, uh, again, I'm not going to try to... Uh, pronounce that. But anyways, so they've got Franco's forces backed up into one territory right now, but they, again, even with five territories, did not get uh, the recruitment role, so they got no free units. So now it looks, based on territory possessed, that uh, the Soviet-backed forces are on the verge of victory, but actually, if you look here, um, Franco's forces are in strong position. They've got three infantry, two artillery, and a fighter. That's more than enough to take at least the northern and southern um, held territories, which has a single infantry and then an infantry and artillery up here. Even in Madrid, um, it's an infantry, a cavalry, a fighter, and a tactical. So uh, Franco's forces might actually try to go into Madrid here on turn two, especially considering Germany will again supply them with a unit. Now, um, not that Germany wants to spend uh, 10 IPPs, but they might if they think that the uh, Franco's forces actually have a good chance of taking Madrid this turn, they might actually send a fighter down there. Um, and that could tip the balance completely in Franco's favor. If not, they'll at least send another artillery and even that might be enough to take Madrid and surely enough to take the northern and southern territories away. So even though Franco's forces are kind of bottled up into a single territory right now, I think they're actually the stronger of the two um, in Spain itself. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, a naval clash will be happening here on turn two. Uh, Franco's forces came up here. They dropped off an artillery and a man that were in uh, North Africa, but now they're in danger of being taken out by this um, destroyer, cruiser, and coastal sub coming up behind them. So probably a naval clash here, um, but that really doesn't matter, you know, if, if uh, in terms of at least uh, Franco's forces, if, this, if they lose these couple of ships, they've already performed 
um, the duty they had to, which was transporting the units off of North Africa into Spain. So it really doesn't matter if they lose those two ships. The main thing right now is what's going to happen in Spain itself. And I think, again, uh, Franco's forces do have uh, the upper hand there. As far as the tech rolls go, um, some com countries actually did really well. The Germans got three of five, and they're going for advanced max wartime economy and proof factories at this point. Um, the Italians got one. They only get one roll, so they were 100% successful. They got wartime economy, and the Japanese had one, and they didn't get it. Um, both Japan and uh, Italy are both going for wartime economy to start off. That's their main um, goal here, just because especially when it comes to the Italians, they don't make a lot of money so that if they can get the tech breakthrough wartime economy, um, that extra money uh, per turn really helps out. Um, the Germans also had went for advanced artillery and I believe um, advanced subs and didn't get those two. As far as the common turn and the allies go, both the Russians and U.S. had good roles. The Russians were three for three. So they're starting out advanced artillery, advanced mechs, and wartime economy. The U.S. was three for four. So improved construction, obviously, for the naval units in a future clash with uh, the Japanese. Wartime economy and then advanced anti-submarine warfare. And if you remember, that's uh, something the Allies are going for based on the German uh, convoy rating in game number one. The British only got one of their um, tech roles. They were also going for advanced um, anti-submarine warfare. They only got improved construction. And then finance, and as far as income tracker, the Germans went up two for Austria, and then that triggered a one um, dollar increase for both the British and the French, and that was it. So that's where things stand after turn one. We're now heading into January 37. Um, things will probably be slow for a few more turns, not a lot going on. Um, again, the Japanese probably going to stay out of this uh, Chinese Civil War for a little bit. Um, Italy has completed their conquest of Abyssinia, and we really only have the Spanish Civil War um, going on on the European side of the map. So probably just the two uh, civil wars going on for the next couple turns, and that's about it. We'll see what happens at the end of turn number two.